We are in an incredibly intense political season, and both sides are calling for massive change, a revolution. And Jerry's going to talk about that right now. So watch your email this week. We will be uh, sending out some information, especially tomorrow. Uh, you want to be paying close attention to that, and that'll get us all caught up. So let me ask you a question at the very beginning today. Um, uh, I think I know the answer to it, but uh, and you can do this by a show of hands right where you are. Don't be embarrassed. How many of you have ever heard of the fundamental attribution error? The fundamental attribution error. Uh, it's something that just about every one of us suffers from, uh, but you don't hear much about it. But it especially kicks in during a uh, political season, and it goes something like this. Uh, what it does is it causes us to attribute people's behavior to their character. In other words, we would say the reason why he acts the way she does or the reason why she believes or acts the way that she does is because that's just the way he or she is. So the fundamental attribution error and bias happens when we assume that a person's actions reflects the kind of person that they really are. Or, and and uh, rather than to take into account that everybody's different, and that may be why they're the, the way that they are. So when it comes to the political scene, it sounds something like this. Some would say, those heartless Republicans, do, do you know why they vote that way? Because I've met every single Republican, and I know all of them. They're, they're heartless. For, for others, it would sound like those corrupt Democrats. Do you, do you know why they vote that way? Because I've met every single one of them, and, and, and I know all of them, and they're corrupt. And you get this thing going back and forth. You know, every single Democrat is a socialist, and none of them will admit it, but I know they are. Every single Republican is a racist, and they'll never tell you that, but I know that they are. And, and so we, we kind of group a bunch of people over here, and we say, this is the way that they are. And this is what I talk about when I say the fundamental attribution error. Now... I hate to burst your bubble, and some of you are going to not like me for this, but mature and emotionally intelligent and curious people don't fall for that and don't believe that at all. But what happens is fear and political rhetoric feeds this, and it kind of grabs us and gets us to say all kinds of crazy things and believe all kinds of crazy things. But I tell you what, I know something about you. That's that you're better than that, and I'm better than that. So let's quit doing that attributing to a group of people, to an individual, what a group of people might or might not believe. And we talked about this last week. And we said when you come across someone with whom you disagree on a particular subject, you need to listen to them. You need to learn from them. They know something that you don't know. And when you choose to listen and learn, you understand more, and you begin to fear less. And in this series, we've said that the issue that the followers of Jesus Christ need to wrestle with is not which party am I in or, or which party I'm a part of or which candidate to vote for. The real question that believers need to wrestle with is am I willing to put my faith in front of my politics? Am I willing to put my faith in front of my politics? And this is not easy to do. And some of you may not be willing to do it. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you have to put your faith in front of your politics. You have to be a follower of Jesus first and then a member of whatever political party or, or th that you're a member of or not. And so what I hope to convince you of today is that when the followers of Jesus do that, when, when that's when things really begin to change in our culture. We do the world a big disfavor. So if you don't hear anything else that I say, hear this. Jesus did not come to be the footnote to a political platform. He did not come to support any structure that's existing now. We said last week that Jesus did not come to take sides, but that he came to take over. That means that he came to replace everything that was in place. And so when you and I today try and filter Jesus to fit our party platform or our candidate, we actually rob the world and, 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 and even our nation and even our community, but we rob the world of a message that at one time changed the world. The Christians, the followers of Jesus, have got to be kingdom people. And when forced to choose between the lesser of two evils, we need to call out the evil that's on both sides. When forced to choose between two imperfect candidates and two imperfect platforms, as believers, we need to call out the wrong and the bad that's in those candidates and those platforms. And this is a really big deal. 
In fact, it's so big of a deal that early Christians actually lost their lives over this. And early Christians began to reshape the world because of this. You see, they refused unconditional loyalty to the emperors, even the good ones. And in doing so, they moved the ethical and moral needle for the empire. And, and, and do you know how they did this? In a world that honored and a world that was, that was ordered around and organized around power and wealth, the church of Jesus stood in direct opposition to all of that. And that's why the empire decided to strike back. And that's why the empire decided to begin persecuting and putting heavy sanctions on the Christians and to try to force them to say that Jesus was Lord. And I cannot overemphasize this, and you need to get this today. In the early church, multiple classes of people whose circles rarely overlapped came together voluntarily and regularly to worship a crucified Savior. And this was just baffling to the people of the empire who believed that the people with power and wealth were the most important people around. When the Christians did that, they did it because the message of Jesus to them was so clear that he had come to establish a new kind of kingdom and everyone was invited to him, to, to it. Not just those with wealth and not just those with power, not just those with the right social and religious credentials. And when they came together, well, here is how Paul described it. He said this, he said, There is no Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So you say you want a revolution? Well, here it is. There is a new system where slaves and free men and masters and rich and poor and citizens and non-citizens all come together. And when they come together in this thing that came to be known as the church, they were all equal. Slavery in the ancient world was not like slavery in the United States of America. Slavery in the United States of America was driven by racism, was driven by the color of someone's skin. But in the ancient world, everyone was literally a potential slave to somebody else. If you owed somebody money and you could not pay, they could make you their slave. If you owed someone for your house, they would not just come for your house, they would come for you or your spouse or your kids, and everyone was a potential slave to someone else. And in these ancient cultures, the dignity of women was, was not even a thing. A, a woman was not considered of much worth to society. But then Christianity comes along and says, listen, in this new kingdom, with this new value system, with this new king, everyone has the same dignity, and everyone has the same place. And the men were told that the slaves and the women had just as much rights and freedom in this new kingdom as they did. I've often said that I think that every woman should, every woman should become a follower of Jesus just because of this. Because you will simply not find this anywhere else in culture, whether ancient or today. And this new kingdom promised justice and fairness and dignity to everyone. And then Jesus makes this statement, and it's huge. He says this, he says the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John, meaning, meaning John the Baptist. But, but after that time, remember John said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. After the time of John the Baptist, a new king steps onto planet earth and things begin to change. And so since the time of John the Baptist, there is the good news of a brand new kingdom. And look at this, everyone is forcing their way in. In other words, everyone is beginning to see the world in a different way. Jesus continued and said, since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached and everyone is forcing their way into it. In this kingdom, the world is, seen, is, is being seen in a very different way. People are being seen in a very different way, in this upside-down kingdom of God. And Jesus comes and he introduces it into the world. And everyone has been invited to participate in it. And you and I today are responsible for sharing the good news of the kingdom of God. And this is why, as I've been saying for five weeks now, we would be foolish as a church, and you and I would be foolish as followers of Jesus to ever be divided over political issues or over a political party because one day that issue and that political party 
will be gone, and Jesus will still be king. Now, let me tell you a true story. About 70 years after Jesus died and was resurrected, so around 100 AD, Trajan was the emperor of Rome. And different emperors had different attitudes about emperor worship, but Trajan was one of the ones that really emphasized it. In other words, he wanted people to believe and to, to treat him like he was a god and that he was to be worshipped. And it was a really political thing, as you can imagine. And in worshiping the empire, you were basically pledging allegiance to the government. So under Trajan, persecution of Christians broke out in several areas of the Roman Empire. So, so there was a governor named Pliny the Younger, and, and he was just called the Younger. That would kind of be like we would call somebody's son a junior today. So there was a dad and, a, and then a junior. But anyway, Pliny became the governor of a province in what is today the nation of, of Turkey. So, so, so the emperor would send out these letters to all of his governors of all of these regions and say, here's what I want you to do, or here's the next thing, or here's the new policy. So Pliny would get these letters from the emperor, and basically Trajan said, I want you to begin rounding these Christians up because they're dangerous. And, and, and there's all of this stuff, and there's all of this stuff in history, and, and you can read it. I mean, this is stuff that you could find. And there's a couple of exchanges of letters between Trajan the emperor and Pliny the governor. And the exchanges are about, and I'm just going to kind of, you know, paraphrase them for us, but, you know, it's kind of like, okay, we've rounded up some Christians, now what do we do with them? You know, and Pliny writes, we didn't even know what a Christian was, we hadn't heard of them, but now we do, and we've, we've tortured some of them like you ask us to, we put some of them to death like you ask us to, and there are several informers, but we have found a whole lot about these Christians that we didn't know about. And so if you go back into history and you begin to read these letters between Trajan and Pliny and going back and forth, remember about 70 years after Jesus, here is what Pl some of what Pliny writes back to, to Trajan. He says that the sum and substance of their fault and error has been that they are accustomed to meet on a fixed day, a certain day of the week before dawn, and to sing a hymn to Christ as to a God. So, you know, we see that these people, the first thing that they did was they would gather together on a certain day of the week before the sun came up, before dawn. And in your imagination, if you will, go back with me 2,000 years ago. And there's a group of people who have embraced Jesus Christ as their Savior. They have no Bible. Uh, they have no Christian radio. They have no summer camps. They have no Christian television. They have some scraps of some letters from Paul and from Peter. And maybe someone who had seen Jesus comes around and talks to them about that. But, but Pliny writes back and says, so we found these group of people and it seems like they get together on a certain day of the week and we know that was the first day of the week. And he said, we, they do it before the sun comes up and, and they, they start out by singing some hymns and, and they sing because that was the only text that they had and this is how they learned the teachings of Jesus and they would get up and they would sing these songs and Pliny said in the songs, they, they believe not that Caesar was a God, but that this Jesus Christ was God. And, and if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, li listen to this carefully, because this is your family tree. You know, if they, they've got, you know, 23andMe and they've got Ancestry.com and, and so we can go back and, you know, people want to trace, well, this was my dad and my granddad and my great granddad and all of this kind of thing. But, but this is our spiritual family tree. In other words, I am a believer in Jesus Christ, and, and I became a believer because my parents and the church I went to taught me about Jesus, but someone told my mom and dad about Jesus, and someone told that person and that person, and if we were to go back far enough, these would be our ancestors, and so this is exciting news for us. This is who and what you and I are connected to. This is, this is who you and I are connected to when we gather, like this morning on the first day of the week, and we sing together. I mean, this is so often, and I think you ought to think about that. The next time that you sing is this isn't just something that we came up with to give you something to do before the teacher gets up and begins to speak. This was something that the believers in Jesus Christ have done for 2,000 years now. 
And Pliny goes on and he says this, and they bind themselves, these believers who meet, they bind themselves to some oath. In other words, they promise one another, they're accountable to one another, not, not to do some evil, not to some crime, but to not commit fraud and not commit theft and not commit adultery and not falsify their trust and, and not to refuse to return a trust when called upon to do so. And, and, and Pliny, you know, maybe kind of saying, hey, emperor, they're like the, the, the best guys in, in our town. I mean, these are people that are honest and ethical and they, they do what they say. I mean, why are we arresting them? And I just want to stop and say, listen, can you imagine what would happen in our communities, where we live, wherever you're watching, if tomorrow morning, just the Christians, before we went to work, and before we went to school, and before we went on that run, or before we went to the gym, or before we went to get that coffee, before we checked our phone, can you imagine if every Christian sang a couple of, sang a couple of songs to Jesus, and in every Christian made an oath to not commit any fraud, and not to take anything that wasn't theirs, and to honor their marriages, and, and, and if we said, we're going to keep our word, and, and, then, and then not only that, that we said that, but then we did what we said we were going to do. And then we closed in prayer, and then we lived that way. You know what? It would be very hard for our culture to criticize the followers of Jesus. I mean, they could only criticize us because of the crazy stuff we believe, but we would be the finest citizens in every community that we're in. And that's what the first century Christians did. And Peter says, if that's the way that you do it, your lives will convince people. And then the letter to, from Pliny to the emperor finished this way and said, when this was over, it was their custom to depart and to assemble again to partake of food. And then this is really strange. He says, but ordinary and innocent food. Okay, now this was a big deal right here because in the first century, the rumor was that Christians were cannibals, that Christians ate flesh and drank blood. Now, a quiz for all of you who have ever been in church in your life. Where do you think the non-Christians got the idea that Christians ate people's flesh and, and drank their blood? Well, in what we typically call communion and the Lord's Supper and the teaching of Jesus where he said, this is my flesh which is broken for you and this is my blood which is spilled for you. And of course, we know that those things were symbolic, but, but those people that were not believers understood that and, and confused that in their understanding to think that Christians were actually... So, so Pliny says, hey, they partake of food, but it's just ordinary food. You know, it's just whatever everybody else eats, emperor. It was innocent food, what he called it. So, so he's like, hey, emperor, we, we, we sent people in to check this out. And the rumors are not true. This is just ordinary food. These are good people. So remind me again, why are we persecuting them? They're not doing anything wrong. Now listen, Christian believer today, this is how we got here to where we are. That is why 2,000 years later we're here. Now, now, now think with me for a moment with this, if you will. If you're a believer and a follower of Jesus... The, this, is our, this is our spiritual family tree. I mean, if there is a ChristianAncestry.com, this is it. And you could trace your spiritual birth all the way back to these people. And it was not because of what they believed. It was because of how they behaved. And that's what changed the world. So how do you know they changed the world? Well, let me ask you this. Anybody seen the Roman Empire lately? However... There are churches in almost every major and minor city, town, and village in the world today. And the next time that we are able to gather on our church campus, and we are singing, and you don't like that song, or you don't like to sing, I want you to think about your spiritual heritage and what that meant to those people. Our people, 2,000 years ago, would gather, and they would sing about Jesus and the reason that they would sing was that most people couldn't read. And not only couldn't they read, but they didn't have anything to read. There was no the Bible yet. And like I said, there may have been some fragments of writings of Paul and Peter, so they would learn their theology through songs that they would sing. And Pliny said that they would sing songs to Christ as if He were God. Sounds dangerous, doesn't it? I mean, honestly, Emperor, we cannot have a bunch of honest people who keep their word and commitments running loose in our community. 
But let me tell you something amazing about our spiritual ancestors as well. In the pagan religions, there was no morality. There was no civil law. There was civil law when it came to taking, keeping order. But when it came to gods, the gods of the pagan people didn't care how you treated each other. They didn't care how you treated your spouse. They didn't care how you treated your children. They just wanted their blood sacrificed. And now suddenly there's this new thing. And there's this new king. And the idea that somehow in their worship of their god... They believe that there is a moral component and that if I'm going to worship God, then I am accountable to my God for how I treat other people. And again, the people in power and wealth with all of the social and political and religious connections found this group of Christians just pathetic. From their perspective, this whole thing was just weird. But many, many people found the upside-down kingdom values and the person of Jesus irresistible. We said last week that the Christians refused to abandon the sick and the weak. The Christians no longer left babies out to die that people simply did not want to raise. The Christians extended dignity to slaves. The Christians extended dignity to children and to women and to people who did not believe like them. I mean, who are these people? What kind of person would live like that? The social commentator Jordan Peterson writes this. He said, Christianity achieved the well-nigh impossible. This is the part, he said, that we cannot even begin to get our minds around. The Christian doctrine elevated the individual soul. And listen, friends, this was unheard of in the ancient world before Jesus. The implicit worth of every single human being. And while this at first sounded appalling to the culture, as they watched the Christians live it out, it became appealing. And in time, it became irresistible. And against all odds, a group of people following a crucified rabbi with no territory and no military and no political power, whose message was built around two pathetic ideas, to to love their God with everything they had and to love each other in the same way that God loved them. But those ideas changed the world and it shaped Western civilization. And every single person who is a follower of Jesus Christ today is a part of that movement that still is continuing to this day. And so we dare not be divided over something as trivial as a candidate or the platform of a political party that one day will cease to be And you may never understand why someone could call themselves a Christian and disagree with you on an issue or a candidate, but we should never allow that to divide us. Because this message that we carry, that began 2,000 years ago, that there is a king who gave his life for his subjects, has come to take, not sides, but has come to take over. And the message that we are accountable to each other, to care for each other, to carry each other's burdens, and that we're accountable to that God. Listen, that message is just way too important for our community and our nation and our world to miss. Now, next week we're going to wrap this up and take one final look, and I'm going to give you my thoughts on the presidential election. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. We're thankful for the the opportunity to sing and realize we have that in common with with people of like faith over 2,000 years ago. And that we do believe as we sing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that's why we sing. God, that this message was so powerful that what was known in secular history as the most powerful empire who ever lived on the face of the earth is no more. And yet all around the world, you can go to just about every small city, village, and town, and you'll find a building with a cross on the top of it. Father, we know who wins this thing. And yet sometimes we act as if we have no idea, and so we've got to fight and scrap and battle. But you haven't told us to do that. You've simply said, believe, and then live it out. Live it out. So God, help us to do that. God, be with our country this week. It's going to be a tough week. A lot of stuff going on. God, help us as believers not get caught up in the affairs of the empire, but God, that we'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Father, we're thankful for Jesus today, and we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.
Hey guys, thanks again for joining us today. I am bringing you those three things from right inside of BJ's Flowers and Plants, located just off of US 1 in Edgewater. BJ's Flowers and Plants is a family owned and operated florist that has been in our area since 1981. And they offer beautiful and unique and personalized arrangements for all occasions. So if you have an event or you just wanna give a special gift, check out their website and phone number and give them a call. And remember, flowers fit every size. Here are those three things. The most important question for believers to answer during this season is, am I willing to put my faith in front of my politics? The kingdom values of Jesus are too important for our community and our nation to miss. Jesus did not come to be a footnote to a political platform. He did not come to take sides. He came to take over. All right, guys, that's all three of them. Thanks again for joining us, and we will see you next week.